Over the past 45 years, Jerome Powell has risen to the role of chairman of the Federal Reserve with zero resistance, despite his lucrative career in banking and private investments. Throughout his journey, he has aided the criminals on Wall Street and crushed American companies underfoot in order to turn a profit for himself and his friends. Powell has delivered a kill shot to the American economy, the effects of which we may never recover from. He's known as the King of Wall Street and will go down in history as the American Angel of Death. I lost my mom when I was 23. In order for the staggering nature of Powell's corruption to truly sink in, you need to know some backstory. I'll try to make it as interesting as possible. Powell graduated from law school in 1979 and worked as a lawyer until 1984. He quickly realized big money was in banking, so he joined an investment bank called Dillon Reed & Company. Over the next six years, he rose to vice president and worked alongside chairman Nicholas F. Brady. This is where his spiderweb of corrupt connections to Wall Street began. Brady and Powell both jumped ship at the firm. Brady became the secretary of the treasury and Powell became the undersecretary. While those two worked at the treasury, their connections on Wall Street were up to no good. In 1991, it was discovered that Salomon brothers, the biggest bank on Wall Street at the time, had committed fraud in the U.S. federal bond market. Firms were only legally allowed to buy 35% of the offerings at treasury auctions. Salomon Brothers had bypassed this limit by placing orders for itself in clients' names. The government sells bonds to buyers all over the world in order to raise money for government operations. Fraud in the system could undermine international faith in the U.S. bond market, a huge national security risk. It was up to Jerome Powell and his entourage to decide how to punish those responsible at Salomon. It a pivotal hearing in 1991, senators were pressing JP to revoke Salomon's privilege status as primary dealers. In the hearing, one of the senators questioning Powell and his entourage said, If it is not an incidental firm and you have got all these other dealers, why are they still doing business after this? I think if you were doing your job, they would be suspended. Anyone that was involved in market manipulation would be. I think that is probably a widespread thought. Mr. Powell, do you want to comment on that? Powell responded with, I would defer to President Corrigan. The New York Fed is the regulatory body that bestows the primary dealer status on individual firms. Executives at Salomon knew they had to keep their primary dealer status at all costs. They made private phone calls with Jerome Powell and struck a deal with him. Those responsible for the fraud would resign at Salomon. Warren Buffett would take over as CEO and Salomon could keep its status as a primary dealer. One of Salomon's executives, Stephen Bell, credited Powell with keeping Salomon alive. This was the first of many times that Powell would save Wall Street from the consequences of their corruption. The Salomon executives who resigned went on to huge Wall Street jobs. Jamie Dimon is now the CEO of Chase Bank. Michael Corbat is the CEO of Citigroup. Mr. Corgan joined Goldman Sachs shortly thereafter. Powell's connections and influence were rapidly growing. He was able to take full advantage of this when he joined the Carlyle Group in 1997. Carlyle is a private equity investment firm, meaning they seek investments in companies that aren't publicly traded. They specialize in utilizing government connections to make tremendous profits. Company leadership was filled from the top down with men who had history in finance and government. David Rubenstein was former staff to Jimmy Carter. James Baker III was a former treasury secretary. Frank Carlucci was former defense secretary. George H.W. Bush was an advisor to the firm. And now the company had Jerome Powell on their side too. Carlisle is where Powell would strike it rich. They acquired a company called Rexnord through something called a leveraged buyout, or LBO. An LBO is the acquisition of a company using mostly borrowed money, with the target company being posted as collateral. The terrible thing with LBOs is that after the acquisition, the target company gets loaded with all the debt that was used to acquire the company. In the case of Rexnord, Rexnord's debt level instantly jumped from $413 million to $581 million, and its annual interest payments rose from $24 million in 2002 to $45 million in 2004. Rexnord would pay more money on interest costs than it earned in profit during every full year that Carlyle owned it. By early 2005, Rexnord still carried more than $507 million in debt and paid twice as much money on interest costs as it earned on profit. The debt crushed Rexnord. Rexnord employees in Milwaukee agreed to take an average pay cut of $3 an hour, along with other concessions in order to convince the management team not to move 70 jobs to North Carolina. Despite this, Carlyle was ruthless. Powell loaded more debt onto the company in order to acquire another manufacturing company under Rexnord. The acquisition would make Rexnord more attractive to potential buyers. Carlyle ended up selling Rexnord for $1.8 billion, a two times return on investment. 80% of the money went to the investors that put up money for the buyouts and 20% went to Carlyle. Powell made out with millions. Rexnord, on the other hand, was forced to lay off more blue collar workers and move jobs to Mexico just so that they could shoulder the $100 million annual interest payments that Powell's team had forced upon them. This same man is controlling monetary policy for the most powerful country in the world and is up for re-election on February 15th, 2022. Save 
consist of saying worry would be a dead horse. Between 2005 and 2011, Powell founded another private investment firm and became a managing partner at a second private equity firm. In 2012, Powell was nominated to the Federal Reserve Board of Governors by President Barack Obama. Since then, he's been legally required to report the amount and date of any personal trade transactions. Powell has habitually failed to do so. Take a look at these trade reports by Powell. He has improperly reported the date of several transactions by marking it as multiple. What does that even mean? It gets worse. See those dates here? There's a trading blackout period for Fed members of 10 days surrounding any Federal Reserve meeting because what's announced at those meetings can easily move markets. These trades were made on the final day of an FOMC meeting. These trades were made three days before a December FOMC meeting. As one article puts it, how do we know Powell wasn't using multiple to hide disclosure of far more transactions during the restricted blackout period? We're only scratching the surface and this is just a single year of Powell's long tenure. Experts agree the problem with all this is Fed officials, and especially the Fed chair, have material non-public information all the time. In fact, it's the most important information that you can make the most money on in the quickest period of time. The 2008 global financial crisis brought the world economy to its knees, and by the time late 2019 rolled around, the American economy was still feeling its effects. The actions the Fed had taken in response to the crisis irreversibly damaged the fabric of the American economy. But I have a hard time understanding why we are giving $700 billion to the Secretary of the Treasury, who was the former CEO of Goldman Sachs, who, along with other financial institutions, actually got us into this problem. It was one giant house of cards just waiting for something to come along and shake the table. In September 2019, something did exactly that. Corporate taxes were due and large amounts of federal treasuries expired at the same time. This drained a huge amount of cash out of the banking system and threatened to cripple it. In response, the Fed announced that it would be loaning $690 billion per week to Wall Street firms at interest rates near zero. There's no chance the firms would be able to get loans elsewhere for less than double digit interest rates. Again, these bailouts were unprecedented or highly questionable for the following reasons. Not one hearing was held by Congress on the matter. Not one official elected by the American people has authorized these loans. The loans are not being made to commercial banks, which could reloan the money to stimulate the US economy. The loans are going to the New York Fed's primary dealers, which are stock and bond trading houses on Wall Street, who count hedge funds among the largest borrowers. The New York Fed is owned by its members' banks in its region. Representatives of these banks sit on its board of directors. It is thus too conflicted to be in charge of this bailout money spigot, which is ultimately backstopped by the US taxpayer if the New York Fed fails. The parent organizations of five of its primary dealers have admitted to criminal felony counts brought by the US Department of Justice for frauds against the investing public. Bailing out felons and Wall Street firms with serial histories of wrongdoing perpetuates moral hazard and thus more wrongdoing and bailouts. Powell's friends at Citigroup, JP Morgan Chase, and Goldman Sachs are just a few that received Powell's bailout money. Goldman Sachs received over a trillion dollars, and Powell himself owns millions in Goldman Sachs equity funds. Shocker. For whatever reason, there were crickets surrounding the event. Media outlets refused to cover it. It was transparently obvious that the financial system was hurting, and badly. It's important to keep these two things in mind. 1. The only reason these banks are so unstable is because they are always over leveraged, sometimes 100 to 1. This means that every million dollars they spend is backed by $10,000 of actual money. 2. This bailout money was printed out of thin air. Ultimately, US taxpayers will pay the price for these bailouts. They got zero input on whether or not these bailouts could happen, and yet were forced to pay trillions of dollars in taxes for corporate bailouts. It reinforced the idea to Wall Street that they could get away with anything. Powell would always keep them in a fairy tale bubble where they're shielded from the consequences of their actions while everyone else suffers the fallout. By the time February 2020 rolled around just before the COVID outbreak, corporate debt had topped $10 trillion. A sudden decrease in asset values could destroy everything. I would say that the pandemic was the straw that broke the camel's back, but that wouldn't be accurate. The camel was already paralyzed. Powell's pandemic response put a bullet in the camel's head. The rapid decline in asset values caused by COVID made it so that big companies all over the US were at risk of defaulting on their debt. In response, Powell announced that for the first time in history, the Fed would be buying over a trillion dollars of corporate debt. This included some of the Illinois bonds that Powell himself owned. Fundamentally, we have now socialized credit risk and we have forever changed the nature of how our economy functions. The Fed has made it clear that prudent investing will not be tolerated. 
This bailout didn't just save the corporate debt market, it fueled it. By the end of 2020, companies issued more than $1.9 trillion in new corporate debt, beating the previous record that was set in 2017. The cheap debt has helped deliver record profits to private equity firms like the Carlyle Group. In late October, Carlyle reported a record $14 billion in asset sales for the third quarter of the year, helping it pay $730.6 million in earnings to its shareholders, also a record. Carlyle's stock price has jumped about 86% since the beginning of the year. Next up, Powell gave investing giant BlackRock a no-bid contract that allowed them to spend $750 billion of the Fed's money to stabilize the economy. BlackRock ended up buying billions of dollars of its own securities. How in the world is this legal? Did I mention that BlackRock manages $25 million of Powell's money? On top of these ludicrous bailouts, Powell gave tax cuts to giant corporations all over America. The end result of having someone as corrupt and conflicted as Powell at the head of the Federal Reserve? 80% of all US dollars in circulation have been printed in the past three years. Wealth inequality is bigger than it's ever been. Inflation is the highest it's been in 40 years, crushing Americans with skyrocketing prices on everything from meat to cars. Last time inflation was this high, the Fed had to raise interest rates to almost 20% to curb it. This isn't an option today. America has 15 times as much debt now as we did then. Any interest rate hike significant enough to make a difference would crush the government and every corporation in America. We literally couldn't afford the resulting interest payments because our debt is so astronomical. There are no words to describe the overwhelming consequences the American people are going to face simply because this man wanted to put some more money in his pockets and the pockets of his friends. Jerome Powell is quite literally America's angel of death. Since you've been gone, I never seen the song. Oh. I lost my mind when I was 23. And all I wanna know is what the angel of death wants from me I wrote this song holding a baby she slept Now I'm hoping I can save her from the motherfucking angel of death 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 Angel of death